appreciate your willingness to let us move the time up to enable all of us to go downtown after this to attend the opening of Associate Professor of Architecture Don Finlay's 10 Decades Exhibition at the Architecture Center Houston, which is going to be a really amazing exhibit of uh, really of the School of Architecture, of the history of the School of Architecture, history of rice, history of architecture writ large, history of the world over the last hundred years, <laughs> all in 10 books. Um, She's very ambitious. Uh, she's been working very hard, and I think we all need to go over and see it. It's going to be pretty amazing. So, And while I'm in announcement mode, um, please note that there will be a follow-up roundtable discussion tomorrow in response to tonight's lecture. That will be at noon with Frank Marco and Assistant Professor Troy Shong, who will give his response and moderate the discussion. So, okay, when I say that you all know the great machine versus handmade debate, who knows what I'm talking about? Wow. So I have to change that, you, you all know. Okay, so who are, who are the two big figures of the machine versus handmade production debate? Excellent. That's even said in a kind of nice, you know, call and response manner. 1914, the Cologne Board Bus. So Herman Mutasius, Henry Van de Velde, in Cologne, 1914 at the Verkbund. Mutasius favored mass production. You all do know this, even if you're not willing to raise your hand so high. <laughs> Mutasius favored mass production for its efficiency and because he hoped that it would raise the standards of good taste. Uh, Van de Velde believed that the individual artist was the only one able to advance culture and that standardization would, would stultify innovation. Fabrication research has tended to continue to rehash this debate over the last hundred years. Mass customization has tilted the two sides slightly, but frankly, interest in fabrication has focused primarily on proliferation and pattern making. Frank Barco and Regina Leibinger, who met at the GSD, it's always useful to note that um, architecture schools are good matchmaking grounds. It sort of helps um, on the social side of things. Um, so you're in a good environment. So they met at the GSD and then formed Barco Levinger in Berlin in 1993, having managed, they, they have managed to forge an original path through the topic of fabrication, perhaps because they came to fabrication research through industry rather than through the computer digital world. Not that they don't employ digital means, but their fabrication knowledge is directly tied to industry and manufacturing, in part through a series of commissions from Trump, the design manufacturer of laser cut tools based near Stuttgart. Frank and Regina divide their architectural production into three, practice, teaching, and research, though honestly it's hard to say that the three have very clear boundaries. Maybe we'll elucidate that today. Research, um, as one of those three, uh, in turn divides really into two intertwined strands. First, their research into new tools and capacities. To quote Frank, tools shape materials that make forms, not the other way around. And second, their research into production and prototyping, to quote Regina, ideas emerge from the drawn line rather than, rather than the drawn line illustrating an idea after the fact. Both of these areas and both of these quotes are very telling. The first, recognizing that a tool isn't just a tool, but that it has incredible effects upon practice. The second, which underscores that for Barbara Leibinger, representation is not an illustration, but is actual production, whether in the form of mock-ups, illustration, or mock-ups, exhibitions, or prototypes. Now, the, the Cullinan series is not themed, but since it includes important and current voices in the field, we find most semesters that certain themes seem to bubble up to the surface. And indeed, strangely, and maybe it's just because I'm within, deep within it, Frank seems to offer the perfect transition between Michael Hayes last month and Rem next month. Those of you who read Michael's assigned reading might think of Heidegger's question concerning technology, which suggests that technology is less about manufacturing than it is about revealing. Revealing the way that we engage things in the world um, uh, and in some sense, one might argue, or, or, sorry, revealing the way we engage things in the world, and in some sense, one might argue that Barco Levinger's interest or version of fabrication is less about fetishizing materials and details than it is about revealing new possibilities that emerge from working in new ways with tools or from working with new tools. That reveal, that very reveal might well be what Regina refers to as the office's Heltung, or attitude, as opposed to style, which is a term that more frequently applies to offices that focus on fabrication. At the same time, their work introduces some
some of the topics of globalization that Rem will discuss in his centennial talks next month. Beyond the fact that their office is inherently global, Regina is German, but Frank is a boy from Montana, their 11-story TrueTech tower in Seoul exploits the possibilities on its site by entirely redefining the site. Additionally, it offers an example of global production with Swiss machinery ultimately being taken over by Korean producers. I look forward to hearing more about TrueTech, but also about the very recently completed Tulsotal in Berlin, the tower that's on the posters. Please welcome me, well, join me in welcoming Frank, who will talk to us about bricolage. Jeez, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Sarah, for the introduction. It was very good. I'll fix, let me fix that. Um, there. It was very good uh, and very to the point. A little cheeky, I thought, but good. Yeah. Just because you're a boy from Montana. <laughs> um, bricolage. Um, this is, I think, it's been a conversation recently we've had um, in writing a, a project for a, um, a new monograph we're doing. And I think the idea, um, and this was a discussion with Hal Foster um, at Princeton about, uh, and he calls us bricolers in, in the terms of how, how we're working. And I think that really has to do with the idea of. Of, of making do with whatever is at hand. So I think it does speak for the practice in the sense of being um, opportunistic, um, in a sense exploiting new materials, uh, new tools, new methods uh, for producing architecture. So um, maybe going back to an earlier um, time in modernism, um, thinking about what are those things that can trigger um, new ideas about space making, form making, about um, uh, bringing architecture forward. So that's, that's been an important um, aspect how we've been working. And, and most of this work is, is really, um, it's quite dense. It's really from the last, say, um, five years of, of, of how we've been working, what we've been doing. And as, as Sarah was saying, indicating uh, one of the ways we set up the practice is this idea of, of, of these three poles, working between academic work, uh, research work, and, and practice as kind of sem semi-autonomous uh, work areas. I think we like to uh, protect them a little bit from each other. Uh, at the same time, all of these work areas um, uh, inform each other in the practice. So whether we're doing uh, teaching, uh, my partner at the TU in Berlin, or myself sort of bouncing around, uh, it's this idea of how these sort of areas have a chance of informing each other. Um, another sort of, um, I suppose, sound bite that's been an important one uh, since we were students at the GSD was this idea of being a material practice, uh, which means uh, thinking about material as a place um, to begin a kind of process and not necessarily as something that simply, simply becomes um, integrated in the projects uh, later on. So this idea of thinking about material and ideation, about ideas and how uh, those things can happen uh, uh, up front and uh, simultaneously. Um, this idea of tools, and I think um, one of the things we did when we started teaching at the AA in the late 90s was um, an idea, a search for an idea of an architectural prototype um, that emerges from the control of a technical system. So that's, that's kind of a way of saying, um, looking at tools, looking at systems, and seeing what kinds of um, uh, architectural components, uh, what we call prototypes, one-to-one, -one, uh, might be produced by those. So in a way, in a kind of naive way of saying, uh, what are these tools, how do they work, what are their capacities, how can you use them, how can you apply them to uh, the production of architecture. Uh, again, kind of a, a reverse thinking than how we were used to uh, thinking of uh, uh, working as stu uh, students. So uh, in a way, the bad example was, I, I think, somehow as software started um, in the late 80s become available uh, in places like architecture schools, uh, usually the process worked like this. You'd, you'd, you'd uh, create a form with uh, certain kinds of software, uh, think about materializing those forms, and thinking about the tools that produce that. So um, one of the things we did was a kind of shift, beginning thinking about material production, uh, uh, thinking about tools and applying software uh, not so much in terms of representing form, but uh, in actually determining form through the tools uh, that they are controlling, uh, leading to, to form. Um, 
therefore, um, again, this, this kind of cataloging or archiving of different um, uh, tools. And I, and I think also the, the, the one thing about this idea of bricolage is also um, it's an inclusive approach. That means we work digitally, we work analog, hand tools, um, anything we can get our hands on that could have a valid outcome for us is, in a sense, legitimate uh, way of, of working. So, um, click. Uh, another thing we started doing um, is set up networks of, of fabrication partners. Uh, again, working with uh, these kind of groups happens um, uh, up front. Uh, it usually has to do with particular uh, materials or production systems um, and their expertise in, in, in working with those things. So this is, uh, this is a system that we um, uh, continue to add to. Uh, in a sense, this little map is showing uh, where a lot of these fabricators are located and where um, we work with them uh, adjacent or, or you know, not too far away from our studios uh, in Berlin, uh, as well as working with uh, a whole sort of array of really fantastic uh, European engineers, structural engineers, uh, energy uh, engineers like Matthias Schuler, uh, and also uh, usually start workshop processes, projects or processes with them uh, at the beginning of the process and have also used institutional partners uh, from uh, MoMA to uh, the German architectural system as a way of, of using the exhibition or installations as a kind of halfway position between uh, completely experimental work and say uh, our building projects as a way of, of testing ideas, a way of uh, demonstrating um, ideas, and, and a way of sort of triggering a, um, a, a discussion about those. Um, Another thing we did a few years ago was, as we were producing this kind of research and these experiments, uh, we consolidated it into a series of, of catalogs, sort of like manuals, the so-called uh, Atlas of Fabrication. This was also an exhibition at the AA uh, that went to uh, Berlin uh, that operated around the idea of doing something, sort of action verbs. So um, if you thought about uh, a list of action verbs from a sculptor like uh, Richard Serra, about, say, uh, rolling uh, or, or breaking or twisting, uh, looking at tools as a way of affecting uh, material in a certain way to produce certain results. Um, what this did then is it produced a kind of uh, exhibition um, which showed not so much any one specific building, um, but sort of output that had to do with different production um, cycles, which also operated on a whole array of different uh, scales uh, in the work. So um, this was a show uh, that then traveled to, um, to, to Berlin uh, that was almost kind of shown in an almost quasi-scientific uh, way of different, showing different systems, in this case, uh, roof systems, tiles. Uh, in a way, some of these were working models from particular um, projects, but in a way for us, uh, in a sense, to become our own experts for the things we wanted to do, um, where we could produce uh, whole sets of building components and elements um, that we could catalog and use and sort of employ uh, when we needed for particular projects. Um, but as a whole kind of um, ambition in the office to continually produce these things uh, that could be activated uh, for a project um, or not. Um, so that in this example of uh, revolving laser cutting, and this comes also from Trump, uh, they are um, pioneers in laser cutting for sheet metal and profiles uh, through the 70s up to now, um, to take a new machine like this and then uh, simply to test it to see how fast it could, could cut, the kinds of shapes or forms it could cut uh, without any kind of um, real qualification, just seeing what it could do uh, to produce these kinds of, of elements um, and a second iteration of that uh, started to um, place them in arrays that um, could possibly be an idea for uh, a structural system or, or, or a kind of facade system uh, and then find applications. So that would be a kind of three-step uh, way of, of looking at a, a tool that could produce um, work, an off-the-shelf element um, that could then later have an application, in this case for showroom. Uh, in Sweden that could have um, a kind of aesthetic or a visual effect. Um, at the same time, uh, we started to think about how it could work in a kind of performative way where this could actually be the sunscreening uh, for the building uh, as well as, say, revealing 
or, or, or hiding the kinds of things uh, they were selling in the space. Or another example, um, uh, prototypes for space frames, which was also a historical project. We're thinking about how space frames were made in the 70s. Uh, what would that mean now with new uh, capacities for, for cutting, uh, for laser cutting uh, frames that could differentiate uh, through the frame uh, relating to structure? Uh, as a kind of um, research project then um, embedded in um, a competition, in this case for the Kunsthalle uh, Museum Project uh, in Zurich, uh, how we could sort of create these pieces as a, as a kind of research project within the competition and then look for applications, in this case, uh, the entrance facade for the museum spaces uh, as both the kind of structure for holding the roof as well as um, um, a system that could control daylighting and uh, the sort of heat and cold energy coming into the building. Um, other examples of this kind of specific research area were um, uh, installations, in this case a kind of chandelier installation for a gallery uh, in Berlin, in this case similar elements, different material, uh, a different machine that could cut plexiglass instead of steel, um, starting to use scripting, um, going from scripting type software to which we use at the beginning simply to make patterns, to make ornament, to actually using it to solve uh, problems like this, problems of ge geometry where you have uh, tangent um, geometry in here to where we're using it now to solve uh, um, structural uh, problems uh, or to use it as a kind of um, installation uh, scale at, at Venice a couple of years ago where uh, again, we could cut uh, a whole array of unique pieces that could combine uh, into a kind of pegboard uh, surface that could be rearranged uh, over the four-month uh, period of the, of the Bian Alley that would um, begin as a highly organized system that could be um, taken apart or um, beginning to look at these tube sections um, to produce um, a, a pavilion system. Another sort of type, I suppose, um, are uh, these installations, uh, exhibitions, um, but also um, a, a kind of pavilion scale project has been sort of a good scale or good format for testing some of these systems. Uh, by laser cutting uh, tubes in a certain way here, uh, we could realize uh, we could produce uh, complex radiuses uh, at different rhythms where each one could be unique uh, with students from uh, Penn and uh, GST we started producing um, a whole array of pavilion possibilities for the German Architecture Museum uh, in Frankfurt uh, for their 25th uh, year anniversary, uh, realizing that we could, uh, in this case, actually bend uh, these tubes into unique radiuses and then start to think of a cladding system for the pieces that could um, uh, be built in the garden uh, of, the, of the museum for doing that. So, uh, that could be sponsored and, and used. So these are the uh, different forms we uh, uh, looked at and then uh, with Werner Sobeck began to look at uh, cladding applications for this, uh, for kind of you know, summer application, uh, in this case a kind of Macalon glass uh, that overlaps like a shingle with a very simple um, Velcro attachment onto the thing. So. Um, both the idea of producing the form but also solving it and then with Transolar understanding the, the ventilation possibility for it, the, the, the solar uh, use for it. Um, at the same time uh, switching materials we looked at a, another series of pavilions uh, in Stanryar in Norway uh, for an artist by the name of um, Cecil Tolis uh, who needed um, a series of pavilions which could be added over the years each year um, she could add a, a new cell to this system, in this case a digitally cut uh, timber system which is I think one of our favorite sort of sustainable materials, uh, a glue lamb, uh, wood, it's easy to assemble, it's easy to cut, uh, producing these um, uh, arrays or these, these sort of cell systems um, and then looking at that with uh, a membrane uh, ETFL or TFE I think they call it here, a cladding system uh, for going and how that would, would start to work. So um, again, this is almost, these pavilions are almost a sort of uh, sort of side department in the office for producing and testing some of these uh, cutting and material systems um, that doesn't have quite the same demand as say the more um, worked out rigorous architectural uh, projects we were doing, but at the same time 
uh, are interesting for us in terms of uh, how you can produce additive systems, uh, how you can prefabricate systems that can be done quickly and brought on site uh, and then put together. So as a kind of conclusion uh, for, for some, of the, uh, some of the experimental work we're doing. Um, at the same time, recently we found ourselves doing things, uh, uh, sort of quasi-architectural projects uh, in terms of patenting in this case. Um, we helped a friend of ours, Tessa De Dean, for her uh, Tate Turbine Hall project in, in London, uh, where she did an analog film called Film, uh, which um, is a kind of um, portrait format film in that huge hall, if you've ever been in there, um, that ran a series of images uh, through the film. Uh, in order to make this happen, um, she relied on us to produce uh, digital masks uh, for the gateway for the um, film projector. Um, with these masks, we could cut these, um, or actually we didn't cut these, these were actually positives. These were um, um, printing, 3D uh, digital printing um, that could then uh, produce the screens and the effects in almost a kind of collage uh, sense of, of, of controlling the film. So in order to make this film possible, um, we were able to sit down with her and, and in, in a sense invent these things that never existed before uh, and then uh, combine them with these existing uh, film gates to produce um, the thing. So even though uh, Tessa is extremely insistent on the idea of using uh, analog film and not digital film, um, she had no qualms at all in terms of using uh, fairly high technology or digital fabrication for producing uh, the film gateways to make the film uh, possible in the first place at all. Um, the second half of the talk, I wanted to show a few pro handful of projects that we're doing. Um, and there was two points I guess I wanted to make. I mean, one was um, that we're doing this kind of fabrication, this research thing, but at the same time, uh, we're very committed to being um, um, a building practice. Um, we'd love to do a Guggenheim Museum, I think, at some point, but um, most of the buildings we're doing are kind of everyday building types. We're doing factories, um, office buildings, um, uh, restaurant cantinas uh, for these kinds of factories. And, and one of the things we were interested in was uh, can this technology, in a way, uh, boutique, uh, sort of trickle down out of a boutique scale uh, to what we see as a kind of everyday um, building technology. So, and, and the True Tech building in Seoul was, was very much a kind of core and shell building. Uh, it's in this so-called digital media city uh, in, in Korea. Uh, it's a place uh, we never worked before. Uh, we were used to working in these highly saturated historical sites in Europe. Uh, this site was uh, out towards uh, the DMZ up in the north. Uh, when we got to Seoul, we discovered this extremely uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, city uh, constructed of images, uh, constructed of a whole diverse scale of buildings, and uh, had, we had inherited this kind of site plan uh, that this building would go in. So for us there was absolutely nothing had been built, it was a completely new site, completely empty. Um, we had no sense of, of what a context uh, would be, so rather than uh, the idea of trying to generate something from that site or that kind of context uh, less uh, place, uh, we started thinking about um, a facade. We knew the facade would be something we would have a much, much higher um, degree of control over uh, than, say, um, you know, the kind of rent space um, uh, based on, on office space. Uh, we started to look at um, precedents like this, the Hancock uh, from Pei and Harry Cobb um, that use famously this reflective glass facade uh, back in the 70s with this story of its relationship to the context, Trinity Church there. And, and in a way what really fascinated us about the facade was that, it, that it's not perfect. These sort of slight imperfections uh, in the facade are really what makes it um, quite, quite interesting. If you remember the famous story when the glass was popping out, it was replaced by uh, plywood. So um, what we started to do, and of course we were also into uh, known other precedents like uh, Mies van der Rohe's famous glass uh, high rise for Friedrich Strauss, the uh, theoretical project of the 20s, um, began to produce mock ups uh, in our courtyard. So this is our office, you see kind of pixels are uh, kaleidoscopically fragmented in the background. 
uh, started producing these large mock-ups, um, which again weren't so much representing the idea as, as precisely showing exactly what the effect of, of reflection is, uh, of movement, of passage, of opacity versus, say, um, transparency, and began to think about this as a system that could wrap, again, a fairly straightforward 12-story um, uh, corn shell building uh, as a kind of uh, wrapper on four sides of this and then uh, over a kind of um, parking garage. So, um, so this is the building right at completion. You see this whole sort of new city being built um, from left to right. Um, and, and, and in a kind of emerging context, um, which was um, very much kind of glass gridded um, um, office buildings, uh, that we could produce a building that would react um, to those buildings and, and in a sense mediate between all those things. Uh, in order to figure out how to do this, we started uh, looking at patterns, uh, beginning to understand the limits of glass sizes, uh, the frames were made in Korea, the glass came from uh, the U.S., from uh, Minnesota, uh, looking for systems to create, in a way, uh, the greatest amount of diversity with uh, the simplest means. So in a sense, we had uh, one type. You could turn it upside down and get a second type. You could have 3D elements. You could have 2D. Uh, you could space them in a different way um, to produce, um, in a sense, a, um, a facade that had also no precedence. So, um, we had to find a fabricator who was willing to do it, willing to test it, uh, willing to permit it uh, on a building uh, where it could wrap uh, on four sides with an offset core and get that to work in a relatively um, shallow depth of about 25, uh, 30 centimeters uh, to produce uh, this kind of effect, uh, including a kind of um, punched uh, entrance here, uh, showrooms here and showrooms here, and then office spaces above. So. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the, the base type here, which is flipped over, and the sort of um, relationship between um, uh, two-dimensional surfaces and three-dimensional surfaces and how that uh, makes this kind of uh, pattern. Um, it was drawn digitally. We did all this. At some point, it got too complicated. We couldn't understand it. So we went to our shops and started producing the frames um, in, in wood, simply to understand uh, how the connections could work and uh, trying to understand how they would um, work both as a kind of exterior um, um, phenomenon as well as, as an interior one which produces a facade that's kind of like, uh, in these loft spaces, like a kind of lattice uh, surface through it and then kind of doing the math on the whole program to see how many uh, separate pieces we would need to make the pieces, um, had them cut uh, in the States and then shipped over uh, took off the shelf um, framing extrusions uh, with a little bit of extra metal on them. Um, because of that, we could cut them in these different angles and combine them uh, to produce uh, the joints. So this is this kind of off-the-shelf aluminum extrusion. Uh, this is a, a German machine that the Koreans bought and taught themselves how to cut. Uh, and this is a sort of um, a catalog of different parts they use uh, for producing that. Those pieces then they took with these kind of joint stiffeners uh, to control the geometry and put the whole thing together uh, where they could be assembled uh, in, the, in the factory uh, in Seoul. So here are the frames being put together. Uh, in order to do this, they had no experience. We had no experience in this. Um, uh, we brought Jerry from um, Arups in Hong Kong. He would come in and do workshops with these guys uh, and they would put them together. Some of the work was done extremely high tech. Some of it was uh, just just handmade sort of kidding of these joints. Uh, so uh, in a combination of techniques, we're able uh, to put these things together. Uh, like our earlier prototypes, we ended up uh, producing a mock-up or, or what we would call a prototype of the sod here, um, tested it, blasted it with, with rain and water to see if it would perform. It worked okay up to kind of ty typhoon strength uh, storms and then we got the approval uh, to build and produce it. So uh, these are the guys staging the pieces coming on site. Uh, some of them are quite huge, uh, lifting them in place and putting them together. So this also meant that the construction, um, which is an unusual, but uh, could, could happen uh, uh, extremely quickly in terms of actually uh, putting the building together. Um, so there's this aspect of 
um, and this is different than the building you'll see a little bit later, the total one, in the sense that it's truly um, um, a curtain wall, and we were really interested in the visual effect it would produce it, uh, by night, by day, it can be opaque, um, it can reflect, um, it can be semi-transparent, uh, um, it changes in weather, people going by at nighttime, it becomes even um, more transparent. Uh, and is affected by, say, advertising or the LED uh, lighting that's uh, typical to uh, Korea or Seoul around it um, to the point of people uh, walking by or um, weather, um, snow, rain uh, is affected by it. Oh, uh, the window washers are insane. Um, I had to point that out. You don't see that in Berlin too often. Um, and in this context, in this kind of uh, new town and uh, old housing stock, uh, there were other kind of projects within it, these, these large barn doors that we produced, uh, the indentation for the opening, um, as well as um, uh, a stair uh, that's suspended in the entrance that we developed with uh, Schleich Bergemann engineers in, in Stuttgart, which is a, a stair that's completely suspended uh, from uh, the ceiling of the project. So uh, this is the stair here. We also did uh, another wall based on the facade uh, idea in wood for the, for the lobby uh, as, as in, in a way sort of special projects um, uh, within uh, the whole project. Um, I think um, one of the things, I guess we started thinking about patents because within six months our facade had been copied perfectly for boutique uh, in downtown Seoul, uh, which was both flattering and shocking at the same time. Uh, it was even better, it, I think it was built better than ours, so it was uh, completely astonishing, and uh, they were very proud of that. Um, but uh, uh, if you have a good idea, uh, it can travel. Um, Gatehouse, uh, this is a, this is kind of a combination project, uh, 2007, 2008, and um, these are another projects that started to really embody uh, all aspects. This is some of the buildings where we started to design all components, structural components, cladding, uh, the facade for it, the furniture for it, the lighting systems as a kind of complete uh, uh, work. Uh, this was for Trump, the machine tool company. Uh, it's their gatehouse for their employees, um, for visitors, for clients, uh, and they wanted to express um, their technology uh, in this building. Um, so, uh, of course, we were thinking of uh, uh, history of architects, people like Jean Prouvé, who was doing this in the 20s through 50s through 60s, set up his own factory, produced his own uh, buildings, which all the components were produced uh, uh, in his factory. Uh, this gatehouse is over here. These are some earlier projects we did for the company, um, but it was really a kind of introduction to uh, fabrication technologies. Uh, through them. Uh, the gatehouse that sit here, this was previously the back of the factory. Uh, this we've uh, continued to add over here, um, but um, it's a factory, it's a family owned factory. Um, the idea of blue collar workers, white collar workers coming together in both this gatehouse and this cantina, which you'll see in a minute. Um, but we, we, we sort of went to the factory to see what kinds of things they were producing for some of their clients, and their clients are from everybody from Harley Davidson to Alessi uh, to this was a, um, a, a furniture making company who were producing uh, tabletops with laser cut and welded uh, components. Um, so a lot of this for us had to do with scalability. So we were saying, well, if they can do that at that scale, could they do that uh, on a large sort of wildly cantilever, cantilever building? This is a 20 meter. Uh, cantilever uh, as a gateway, and this is also uh, Sobek on this one, so Sobek's pushing us, you know, let's do this, we, I can make it work. So we have this cantilever here with this huge uh, counterweight in the ground over here uh, that's made out of laser cut um, steel and stainless. So, and I, and I think one of the ideas with some of this engineering is, is making things visible or legible that you wouldn't understand or maybe not see before. So. Uh, so we inherited these drawings from Werner, uh, these sort of vector plots that have to do with stress, and asked ourselves, well, could, could we make the, the, um, the structure reveal this in a much more apparent way than simply being this kind of uh, mysterious 
loading pattern that has to do with the ends of cantilevers and loading and compression and tension and all of this stuff. So, um, so we made the models basically exactly how we were going to make um, the building. So this was after many, many, many tests, probably 10 or 12 um, tests, finally made a roof like this that reflects um, almost identically the kind of loading. Uh, again, you have kind of compression here, tension here, and at the end of the cantilever, a very sort of light from German sort of filigran, uh, and that reflected the loading. Um, that idea could be enforced by things like um, the, the pattern of the, of the lighting, uh, which we tapped as kind of a 50 centimeter deep uh, coffer in this structure, and then went to go back um, to, to a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, mock-up uh, to see how it works. So, uh, whereas the tabletop was very seamless, uh, we had to combine many, many systems. So we have laser cutting, uh, good old-fashioned uh, mechanical connections, welded connections, uh, but at the same time, all these components are changing uh, over the length of that structure from uh, very robust elements to very slender, very thin ones uh, that relate to that um, structural uh, diagram to produce a roof that um, cantilevers over a kind of gatehouse and a very simple um, uh, sort of information center here curtain wall again here, and then all of this supported on four uh, columns, and then uh, with, as I said, this kind of very large cantilever uh, or um, counterweight at the end of the building to hold, keep the whole thing um, from, from, from flipping over. So um, these are the pieces coming on, on these sort of um, uh, frames. They're set up on, uh, on site, and then um, um, bolted together and then lifted together as an assembly uh, with these uh, gurneys, these beltways. Um, so, so this was, a, so, so all 2,000 of these uh, workers are out looking at this thing. <laughs> and we kept looking at the film of the Mies uh, roof being lifted in the National Gallery. Uh, so we're, I'm sitting in my convertible smoking a cigar and, and watching this <laughs> thing go up and, and completely, and we're completely terrified that it'll work or not. And we drop this thing on these four, pin them to these columns, and the thing bounces a couple feet up and down, and then slowly settles into place. And then there was this gigantic sigh of relief. Um, to get this thing to work, again, it was extremely dynamic, complex uh, form. Uh, in the end, to get it straight, we ended up putting sandbags on it to, um, to flatten it. It's kind of like a ski. It has a kind of camber this way, and then this way. And the sandbags then sort of loaded uh, the roof into a perfectly uh, straight uh, kind of post-loaded uh, or tensioned uh, uh, form, uh, which is what it looks like uh, today. Uh, within this project, there were other projects uh, within it, like the other, the gateway, uh, and also with Sobek's office, the, um, this sort of invention of a, of a double facade, a kind of energy facade for the building. Uh, based on a classic kind of German garden wall building. Uh, we translated that into um, a kind of plexiglass tube system. Uh, we drew this digitally, uh, and this guy had, poor guy had to, to glue each single one of these things together, so he's sitting here swearing at us while he's sort of gluing these um, tubes together to make these incredibly beautiful um, arrays that fit between uh, a double layer of glass on the outside and a single layer of glass uh, on the inside um, that acts as a kind of sunscreening uh, for the space. Uh, and also the idea in this case uh, with Werner to produce a curtain wall that's entirely made of glass. So it's either uh, float glass or plexiglass including the, uh, the vertical posts. So the entire uh, facade is either translucent um, or trans uh, uh, parent based on how you're looking through it uh, and in order to do that had to um, devise uh, a kind of gasket that can move so if the roof has snow on it and it moves you know five or six centimeters it, it won't be crushed by this you know fairly dynamic roof so uh, produced uh, a joint for that and also uh, in the ground had additional sunscreening uh, that can um, recoil out of the ground uh, up and cover uh, the space. So at night it works like a kind of lantern uh, as a kind of marker for the gateway to this company. 
uh, and by day it's, it's much more, um, yeah, I suppose blurry. Um, that project is, is literally right here at the same time uh, we produced um, this uh, restaurant, so-called. And in these kind of German Mittelstein companies, family-owned companies from 300 to 5,000 people, um, the cantina is, is in a way the sort of center, in a way a social center for the whole um, workplace, for the factory um, where everybody comes together for lunch, but also use it for events, for, for music, uh, for lectures. Uh, for parties, so in a way it's literally the sort of center or the heart uh, of this whole uh, industrial uh, campus. Uh, its shape uh, relates to its sort of fit, I think, urbanistically between some of these existing buildings, uh, therefore and, and adjacency also to the, um, the Autobahn, which is right behind it. Um, we looked at uh, organizational systems, one we were interested in, in and I think which is one that's quite um, accessible in a way to digital uh, technologies are natural systems, hierarchical systems um, like plants. Uh, with the students in the practice, we started producing uh, these models for an idea for a long span roof. And each model that we tested would always have a material idea. So this was always going to be wood. Uh, this was for a steel idea. Uh, and this one was, for example, for, for an idea of concrete. Uh, doing workshops uh, with Banner's office, uh, we settled on a hybrid system of steel and wood. Uh, the steel in order to get it flatter and also to have larger um, spans and then began to test um, a kind of honeycomb system uh, in relationship to daylighting, how we could use the depth, the structural depth, to filter both um, artificial light and daylighting um, into, into the space. Uh, so we also started looking at how to produce this uh, in terms of fabricating it uh, almost at the same time as we finished the model. Uh, this was a little sound bite about finding those guys, in this case uh, a, a manufacturer in the Black Forest uh, that started producing the components uh, so that we built uh, again another one-to-one -one mock up uh, that ultimately got um, built into the roof itself. Uh, a lot of dumbing down in terms of fasteners, making them simpler, making them quicker. Uh, but with the CNC sawing, which um, the, yeah, this guy Gunter is redrawing all of our drawings uh, into his sort of mega center here, sort of hardware, software, and then uh, set up production runs where they could cut with all these um, amazing sort of yeah, <laughs> toolbox. Uh, set up a production run of cutting the, the components which could then go um, on site and be assembled very quickly. So they did a run here and their other, um, next door they were doing one for Segura Band, for the Pompidou, uh, but could produce uh, all of these and again all of these as unique pieces uh, which could go on site um, with these sort of helper columns here be put into place and then decked over uh, until it was structurally um, uh, fit, so sovereign and then, and then taken, taken away. Um, the idea of the building was uh, a kind of excavation. Uh, the whole campus is connected by tunnels underground uh, for service and moving people around, especially in wintertime. And to create almost a kind of amphitheater space that was covered or capped by this um, uh, floating roof which um, hovers uh, over that excavation uh, like this with pretty wide span, 20 meter uh, spans between these uh, column groups uh, as a kind of semi uh, underground project. So in this case the, the steel's already been put up and in this kind of film you're seeing the, the infill uh, going in uh, on a kind of three or four day basis uh, and then the cladding, uh, skylights uh, and, and going into the completion uh, of the space which is this one which is kind of hovering uh, over, over that uh, excavation. Uh, and then really, again, thinking about the roof as something very thick uh, that we can filter light through um, that has a double height space here uh, that then by going underground we generated a kind of mezzanine space over here over the kitchen and technical spaces um, that, that could work. So uh, we like, again, the, the wood timber I think is a really interesting build, uh, material in terms of uh, being a very sustainable one, but at the same time one that's uh, highly engineerable, so we could use it um, quite quite quickly in this system. 
Uh, again, this being the lower level with the tunnel connection here, technical stuff over here, and this kind of multi-purpose space here. Uh, by doing that, again, we gained this, this um, extra mezzanine space here, which uh, they were able to use uh, uh, right, right away. Uh, this with TransLR, with our uh, energy guys, uh, there was a kind of targeting of each one of these cells that could either be used as an acoustical panel, uh, a, a surface for daylighting, or artificial light. So there was a kind of um, formal interest in those cells, but at the same time, each one of those uh, could be programmed um, quite effectively in terms of uh, how it would uh, work and fit into the kind of daylighting ideas of the project as well uh, as the acoustical uh, performance of the space when they use it for for a, a musical uh, events. Um, so, so again, it can be used, uh, and all the, again, like the other building, all the components, the, the facade system, the precast stairs, uh, even the tiles uh, for the back were different systems um, which we produced um, specifically um, for this building, which, which is another interest to me. Uh, ceramics, I think ceramics in, in this country uh, in the last turn of the century, last century, um, there was uh, a huge industry for terracotta. Uh, there's companies in Germany that will still produce relatively cheaply uh, custom tiles uh, for us. Uh, these are uh, pressed uh, into a mold uh, that we had produced um, that produces the facade for the interior for this building as well as uh, the exterior non-glass uh, fa facade uh, for the building. Um, but only to say that, again, some of the, the, the research work somehow uh, ideally finds a place to sort of reside in a project uh, like this as we're developing this sort of experimental stuff. Uh, but this would be a, a perfect example of um, sort of targeting uh, some of that work uh, to a project um, uh, like this, which, again, is fairly uh, unique and singular, I think, in, in the kind of whole portfolio of projects uh, that, that, that we're doing. Um, the project that Sarah was just talking about, the Tour Total, this one, I, I just dropped this in pretty quickly. We just finished this project um, last week uh, in Berlin. Uh, it's in a way related to the Korean one, but in this case it's not a curtain wall, uh, but a load-bearing facade. Uh, it's an important project for uh, Berlin. It's next to the new uh, um, train station, the main train station that was completed a few years ago. Uh, this is one of the last sort of large master plans uh, for Berlin north of the train station. Uh, so the building we worked on uh, for uh, Total, the French petroleum company, uh, was or is the first uh, building within this. Um, so it generated a lot of interest in the city. People wanted to know what it was going to be. Uh, how would you do a high rise now uh, in Berlin uh, after all these cycles of building in the middle uh, downtown? what well, could be a new building. So even though it appears uh, as a kind of solitary building here, uh, it will be embedded in a kind of larger uh, master plan, including uh, new buildings that are coming quite soon um, uh, adjacent to it. Um, the geometry of the building uh, has to do with it um, uh, being in between this kind of orthogonal Heidestrasse here, the train station over here, and, and the radial plan uh, leading to the Europa Platz uh, to the south. Uh, so that ultimately, uh, in the second phase, which we're working on right now, uh, it'll create a pedestrian passage uh, at the base between the tower uh, and the lower building. Um, like I was saying, it's a, it's a low-bearing facade, so we have a kind of off-center uh, core here, and then the facade is um, uh, carrying the floor plates of the building. Um, so that it's also, I think, it was an idea about sustainability. It was about generating a kind of 40, 60 percent uh, relationship between closed surfaces and glass, uh, with uh, sun shading in between these. Uh, so, and it also relates to a kind of history uh, in Berlin of facades with a certain material depth uh, that can appear opaque if you look at it obliquely, or can appear translucent, um, but also to give it movement. So, even for though for the client. Um, it was a, a perfect uh, facade in terms of the economics of it, uh, in terms of sustainability, it works quite well. Um, and for us, we were interested in um, the sort of visual effect of somehow having that facade 
uh, moved by using precast concrete pieces uh, that, in, in, in some sense, similar to Korea, operate on, on, on multiple floors uh, above a kind of moving or undulating uh, surface uh, up through that. Uh, we worked with a group out of Frankfurt. Um, these were uh, digitally cut molds that they made uh, for the concrete. So uh, if that's the, uh, the negative, uh, these were the positive uh, pieces which work over uh, two and four story uh, heights to produce it. They were incredibly uh, precise. The pieces they could make, these are precast uh, concrete. Uh, that are sandwiched with precast on the inside, precast on the outside to make uh, this gridded uh, facade that um, even though we have a lot of repetition, uh, we could produce many um, pieces. So uh, tectonically, the way this works is this is um, uh, precast on the inside, uh, then with a layer of glazing and insulation, uh, and then sandwiched by these T pieces, which um, are um, fastened from the outside of the building uh, to the interior uh, to produce um, a, a composite system. So the logic is a series of T's that are knitted together. They, they overlap. And those T's themselves um, have a kind of uh, faceted surface uh, that runs over four stories to produce the kind of uh, surface effect of it with as combined uh, with the offset. So this is, I think, the poster shot here. Uh, you get a sense of a, a really pretty robust, thick facade that wraps around the entire building, but also uh, works visually on a diagonal uh, across it. So it works very good with oblique daylight, or in this case, um, the lighting scheme for, for lighting it uh, at, at the nighttime uh, within this kind of uh, relatively uh, deep um, facade where the glazing sits back behind here. Uh, enough depth to, to include um, the sunscreening and, and some of those things and then uh, doubling when it hits uh, the base to produce kind of an entrance condition here or uh, the loggia here. So uh, in this case, uh, very much, um, and also historically the idea I think of a, of a um, uh, uh, sort of uh, low bearing facade, um, uh, a frame facade versus uh, the other one, which was a, 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 um, a, a curtain wall facade. Um, again, like the last project, able to, to determine a lot of the interior finishes, the files, uh, tiles for it, um, the, the handrail systems, and uh, wood finishes through it. I think, how are we doing on time? Is everybody kind of okay? Yeah. I just want to show finish with a couple of quick projects again to kind of reiterate some of these ideas. Uh, Smart Materials House um, is, is a competition we won in Hamburg for the International Building Exhibition, uh, which has been around for about 80 years for, for, for testing new ideas for uh, low income housing um, uh, in Hamburg. Uh, in our case, uh, the question was uh, smart materials. What are smart materials? How can you use them? And again, going back to some of our uh, other ambitions, um, how can you have um, an idea for something that's for us new spatially, formally, uh, interesting at the same time, uh, has this kind of performative aspect? How can you combine uh, those two areas in a new kind of architecture um, that could, in this case, spatialize this way? It's scaled for residents. These are loft spaces. They can be uh, divided or kept open. Uh, the material and the sort of depth uh, condition, the way the light comes in the space, it can be very soft uh, in that kind of northern European uh, way, and what kind of shapes we could produce in precast element um, pieces. Uh, in our case, smart material meant um, a combination of uh, self insulated, it's called infralight concrete, which is a, a self insulated concrete. Uh, combined with um, glue laminate wood, which is good for, for decks, uh, that had a pretty attractive CO2 rating. And again, to begin with these materials and see what kind of uh, outcome uh, they might, might lead us to. Uh, so uh, this is the glue laminate here. This is what this stuff looks like, this um, infralight concrete. Uh, you can use either recycled glass, effoment as a kind of aggregate that insulates or uh, with clay. Uh, it's a third the weight of regular concrete, and so it's easy to handle. Uh, and of course, you can shape it. 
Um, another history that we were thinking about as we got into this project was one that's very common to Eastern uh, Europe, this whole history of Plattenbau. Uh, this is Khrushchev uh, looking at a model of Plattenbau being produced for Eastern uh, Berlin, which were precast uh, pieces of concrete, uh, which could be combined and sometimes in very interesting ways uh, for housing, sometimes uh, very ornamental, sometimes very functionalist. Uh, that were sort of building kits that could produce housing which really sort of canvas uh, much, many of the major cities in Eastern Europe if you've been there. Um, the other aspect of this material was um, the idea of poche or thickness, uh, something that had been kind of obliterated through modernism's you know, interest in lightness in glass or steel. Uh, in this case, um, thickness uh, in a self-insulated material is, is a virtue. Um, so we started looking at even in sort of modernist models, in this case Manjurati, of, of the idea of, of, of a thickened wall uh, that we could combine as a prefabricated element uh, to produce uh, a new type of, again, low-income low housing. Uh, there's a multitasking aspect of these things. Uh, they look like this formally because they spatialize in a certain way at the same time. As an element, um, it's self-stabilizing. You can put it on the ground without scaffolding, uh, and it will hold itself up. Uh, we could put coils in it for heating or cooling. Uh, we can use it for solar absorption. Uh, it's very, very light. Um, so for, for us, that was smart. It was smart in the sense of how it worked, and it was also smart in the sense for us how it worked as a kind of uh, architectural uh, component that we could add. So um, these are the guys in our shop uh, at, in the ground floor. Some of you might have been there when you visited last year. Um, but began to build a model, again, exactly how the building itself would be built. These are wire cut foam pieces, which is, again, itself a self-insulating material uh, combined with uh, wooden floor decks. Uh, by, uh, I think we had two or three different types. Again, you can flip these upside down and produce a second type. Uh, we could combine them very easily to produce the model. The model is incredibly uh, stable. You can shake it and it doesn't move with very, very um, simple connections. Um, it has a kind of um, reversibility where uh, you use that sort of facade depth to produce balconies and things like that. And then the reverse side of that uh, element then sort of informs or shapes the, the, the living spaces and sleeping spaces uh, in the apartments. And then again, a kind of um, scaling of the piece is really for, um, not for office building or not for something else, but really for a kind of residential uh, scale. Um, it, you have these sort of serpentine walls on the exterior. Uh, at the same time, uh, it can be divided with orthogonal walls uh, if needed. Uh, it's load bearing as well as the cores, which can be in wood or concrete uh, to produce uh, the spaces of these um, uh, nine or ten uh, flats. Uh, it also meant that um, you could have a very a kind of diverse array of different um, uh, ground floor or upper level um, um, types. Um, in a sense the building really works like a house of cards. Um, the walls above each other can overlap um, like a card house um, without having to worry about this kind of German coal bridge stuff. Um, so that was one of the virtues of the system in terms of uh, differentiating each floor. It could be open, it could be cellular, and uh, each floor layout could um, uh, react slightly uh, differently. And then thought about how we could build it. So we could um, build it super fast, um, prefabricate the pieces, and then bring them out on these trucks. and get this to click. Um, so this is, yeah, the... the the ground plate, then the pieces, and then uh, stacking the next one on top, and the next one on top, and so forth and so on, uh, so that the whole, the entire sort of rough construction could be put up uh, within uh, two weeks of producing it, and then and then limiting it really to a, a sort of limited um, series of parts. Really, the, the walls, which are finished when you get them, you don't have to add anything to them. Uh, the floor plates, uh, guardrails. Um, and then a wood window system, which was three layers of glazing um, that fit in that. So in a sense, it's really only three uh, major components for putting the whole um, piece together for, and I think we cost it was about 1.4 uh, million euros for the whole thing finished. Um, 
We, uh, we got a, a wholesome prize for this, for sustainability, a European one, then a global one, uh, and then we used the money to build a, a prototype uh, of the wall to prove that it would work, um, which is this um, wall system here, um, which we could lift and we could test it and do all the stuff to it to see if it worked, um, but to actually show it as a, as a valid system that we could put uh, into play. So this, this project is, is marching ahead, but that, that was, uh, the idea of it in the competition phase, um, and then, then we wanted to tr try it out also in a sort of crazy scale, scale size scale, in this case um, for a high rise, uh, with the idea in, in Europe we're sort of at the verge of being able to do 15 to 20 story uh, wood high rises uh, with glue laminated floors. In this case the idea is to combine uh, the wood floor decks with um, like a kind of a super chunk version, I guess, uh, of, the, uh, of the other one where these are just blocks of infrared concrete pinned together and holding uh, the floor plates. But this is kind of a, I guess, a future project. This is probably doable in another three or four or five years um, with, with the building code in Europe, uh, in Switzerland and Austria, let's probably go first, but as a kind of uh, high-rise construction uh, in timber wood, including uh, the cores. Um, the last project I wanted to show is, is, is it really is just a small installation in Marrakesh, um, which is another interest of ours, is what happens when you build in different places. I think this idea of building culture uh, is an important one for us. Uh, we had the chance to do uh, an installation uh, at the Marrakesh Biennale next to the Kadobia uh, Mosque, which is the uh, probably the most one of the most important UNESCO uh, sites in Morocco. Um, we were working in our studios digitally on, on ideas about hyperbolic uh, structures, again as a kind of prototype idea. Um, but we're trying to understand how we could filter that uh, sort of form making or geometry through. Uh, local practices, in this case uh, weaving, uh, which we looked at to see uh, how these systems worked, uh, how they were additive, um, what kinds of materials they used, uh, what the logic of geometry was in repetition, and to see if we could translate um, our work, our, in, our interest in hyperbolic uh, structure, uh, through local uh, materials and local techniques, which worked in the end. Uh, quite quite good. So we built a large scale 1 to 20 model here. Um, it was sited uh, next to the mosque in a 5 by 5 meter grid next to the sort of uh, earlier ruined mosque uh, so that the piece in a sense could site specifically fit within that uh, structure and then reconstitute itself in local materials. In that case it, it's meant uh, timber and a kind of cotton yarn uh, we worked with these local guys. This Mohammed ran the crew for this uh, with one of our guys from the Architectural Association. Uh, they were able to build the whole piece uh, within two weeks. And so, again, even though we had these, in a sense, highly sophisticated drawings, I, I suppose, um, in terms of software, uh, everything got done by hand on site. Uh, the materials were bought by donkey uh, to the site, um, uh, local um, carpenters. Uh, built these posts for us, uh, local welders produced these joints for us uh, to put the whole thing uh, together. So uh, it worked for the city uh, with the mandate of the Biennale. It was uh, an idea for activating um, a part of the city uh, that wasn't accessible, especially the cisterns which were underneath uh, this piece here uh, that opened up as a kind of place for encounter uh, within uh, Marrakesh for both the tourists but as well as uh, for the people who live there. Um, so it existed for about three or four months uh, on this site. Uh, it changed during the time of day. Uh, it was solved uh, very simply in certain ways in terms of the, how the structure worked out um, and the surface of it. Um, the geometry uh, was again handmade so um, it has a very beautiful quality because it is handmade also. Uh, but again as weighed against um, our architectural drawings uh, which acted as a kind of control device uh, for the project. Um, yeah, they had a big party there when we finished, so <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Um, I think that's a, yeah, that's the last image. Um, 
just to say, I just wanted to show you kind of a broad scope of, of both the research end of it and through the buildings, the scale of buildings, the type of buildings, uh, and then in the end, this idea of anticipating that it's an ongoing project. Uh, it's something uh, that's evolving. It's what keeps it interesting for us and exciting. And uh, I'll finish on that. Thanks again for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Time for a couple questions. Right okay. Um, I think the argument about uh, fabrication, nothing louder. Uh, sort of argument that uh, uh, sort of engages with the realities of fabrication uh, should proceed sort of unchecked formal uh, invention um, is pretty common. I think there are a lot of architects that uh, will make that same argument. Um, but what seems pretty interesting is the. Uh, sort of uh, ends to which the projects are show uh, we tend to seek out with all the different techniques. Uh, specifically, there seems to be a uh, um, uh, gratification of the surface to sort of working in two dimensions at a time, whether it's a um, facade or a wall or a ceiling or a roof. Um, and I wonder if uh, that's where it sort of marked a lot of your um, attitude or project or the surface making, you mean? Yeah. Sort of yeah. Of, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think this, the surface making uh, is, in, in one sense, is a place where you can operate uh, with a, a lot more freedom than, um, again, say, the Korean project where you're dealing with floor rentable, da -da -da, this kind of things, and the facade is a place where in a way you have a lot more, in a sense, architectural freedom is in the sense of, of developing it. I think um, uh, this idea of depth, I think, is important. I think, I think sometimes the surface meaning can be just a, a, a kind of liminal surface like the Korean one um, versus other ones like the cantina, which becomes a kind of structural depth. So, in a way, maybe it engages in a slightly different way, I think. So um, it's true um, that it's about surface, but it's also, in that case, about space making. And it's really a powerful uh, space that's, that's um, defined um, by that surface, which in, it has a kind of formal appearance. Uh, it's also, again, performative. It works in a certain way. Um, that's actually quite logical. Um, so. I think that, that, that the level of adjustment is an interesting surface, you know, is it? Or in the, um, the last project, Marrakesh, is about uh, rural geometry, straight lines that make uh, a complex surface. But um, again, it really did, I, I really think it did come from the, the techniques that we found rather than trying to render that form um, in a certain way. So I think. Um, be because we, we found these techniques for building it and we had software that could produce these things, um, it was quite logical and it was actually quite easy to do that. And, and I don't think those things are at odds with each other. I want to, I want to maybe pick up on that. One of, the, one of the things I find really exciting in architecture generally is when somebody takes up such a narrow, well-focused topic like you have, material in your case, um, and one of the things I find exciting about that is that that tends to then have ripple effects in various ways. I think about material in the history of architecture, uh, thousands of years old, I, I'll keep this short, don't worry, but let's say uh, thousands of years uh, long, if you think of classicism, it's a kind of an exercise in taking wood detailing, turning it into stone, or producing the order. Or if you think of Gothic architecture, stereotomy and stone right, right. in particular right. is used to produce uh, scholasticism, uh, kind of uh, ecclesiastic architecture, you think of steel in the 19th century, etc. Span, new program types are, are enabled or housed in that. And so I'm looking at your work and I'm thinking, there, I have a, different, a series of responses to what that is that ripples out from the work. One of them, one of them is I'm, I'm thinking of intimating various kinds of things that I'm not, may, I may not be grabbing yet, so I'm wondering if you're going to point to those, and I think you're already starting to answer that in Duncan's question. 
Um, another one would be that there is, we shouldn't actually look for that meta anymore in material. Another one would be that it is in fact a kind of, uh, without applying it to sound pejorative, kind of bling, which is the meta. In other words, it's, it's the fascination with the, the sort of sparkly object in a way. Right, right. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you would position your work there. Between the yeah, between the blank well, and the thing. Well, before that, I'm not elaborating. I'm just trying to yeah. lay out a spectrum of either I don't get it, or it's it's bling, or we shouldn't, or right. Well, in the work, yeah. Again, it's it's maybe and maybe some of these are extreme um, examples also. But I, I think there is a whole spectrum um, between these things um, that, through their geometry, I think are, are more expressive versus other systems which are more, um, say, redundant or more suppressed or, or even neutral systems. So I think um, within the practice, you know, if I showed the other, you know, the other 30 projects that I didn't show tonight, I think it's, it, would be, it might be interesting to see that spectrum where, um, where you pull that, that, that kind of work forward or, or, or it's quieter, it goes through the work in much quieter. And obviously that's based on you know, opportunity or um, program or um, even appropriateness would probably be a word I could use. Um, so you, you, I think you would see a different, uh, a different kind of shift in priorities depending on each um, individual situation. But I think what has happened, which is interesting for us, is that there isn't much, rep I mean, you learn, there is a kind of building on this sort of set of uh, the knowledge that you get, you build on it, but there's, there's still, to me, it, it's still quite amazing the kind of um, differentiation from project to project um, that we're still able to um, get to. There's, there's not a lot of um, repetition. I think you'll see a sensibility, and through, say, detail or attention to detail or, 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 or even, say, surface um, effect, um, but through this whole process, I think, each project can be quite quite unique. Okay. Yeah, so uh, all the models that you showed, right. they all repeat. Uh, each one of them is like one type, maybe two types that are just communicated in multiple ways. And I'm just curious, they, like spatially, when you're inside of the installation or when you're inside of like the two things, when you don't really need that repetition, so I'm curious how you calibrate the well, yeah, um, yeah. There's always a local. I think there's like a local reading when you're standing in front of something and you see that one thing, and then there's another sort of mid-range reading where you see something in its completion. I think, um, for example, how much. Like the, the Korean front facade, right, which has essentially two different types that are recombined. I guess it, it's always the calibration is like how far can you take that before the whole idea collapses, falls apart, doesn't make sense anymore, becomes kind of a hairball, um, a mess. And uh, so I, I think there's always a kind of, I mean, I, I don't know, we were talking about, um, we were talking to writers like Jeff, the, the Eugenies is sort of. We do like 20, 30 different iterations and compare them. So if it's about a system, um, you have to find out your own, you have to establish your own criteria about what's good and bad. And some of these systems that work on repetition and differentiation, um, some of it's aesthetic. I mean, at what point does that system collapse as an idea? Um, but there are multiple readings of it too. Again, I think that's an interesting one, the, the component versus the, the overall um, matrix, the overall system as a kind of, in that case, a kind of brooded system. So, um, but there's always a series of decisions. And it's not always completely scientific. <laughs> Last question, Grant. I was really kind of just agreeing with Ron <clears throat> in that um, it seems like you do have a, um, a real stake in sort of uh, decoration and ornament and pattern. And to me, it seemed most obvious in these really interesting and kind of bold moments where you aestheticize the material sort of larger element into like tile for the outside mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or the sort of balustrade or handrail right. on the interior of the tower. Right. You have the same kind of faceted thing, but it's, it's purely visual and obviously the same logic wouldn't be at play, but you proliferate them to create a screen. And that seems like 
pure beauty, and, and that seems to be the agenda at that point. Yeah. That's an outcome, I'd say. Can I ask another question? Really fast, because we've got to get to the outcome. I'm going to follow up with that. How do you know when you are looking at a hairball? How do you, how do you know it's not a hairball or it is? Uh, I, think, I just think when, when it breaks down, it doesn't, when it's not legible, it's not legible in this system. For example, that Korean thing, it worked on, it also works on a, on a diagonal system where those components, it works in a singular reading of one thing and it works also like five things and it also works like a hundred things. And um, there's a kind of continuity and, and you can see it. If you look at that thing, the, in, in that case it's diagonal like the other one, which, which unifies that as a whole system. So I think um, I, 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 there is a point, I think there is a threshold between it, 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 it falling apart as a system and, and staying within that realm as a, as a kind of an idea of a, organizing a system that's based on X amount of parts, uh, that works locally, that works in its overall universal reading, how that works around a building. And I think that comes very clearly in the whole body of what this Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll save all the additional potential fireballs for tomorrow's lesson. Thank you, Frank.